Right, good evening, everybody. Um, this is our second um, Zoom meeting, and um, the last one I think went well and was well received. So um, I hope you'll all um, have good reception and enjoy this evening. Now, uh, Richard's going to speak to us again because he spoke to us in 2018 um, about North Yorkshire, the moors and the coast and its wildlife. Um, but a lot of us also in 2017, in the summer, went on um, a weekend with him in North Yorkshire and um, we, we had a fantastic time. One of the things I remember although it was a minor part of the weekend really, we were at one stage driving and we went past um, a farm where Richard mentioned the Turtle Dove Project. And that was the first time um, that I, I was aware of it. So it's very exciting that he's going to come and talk to us tonight. Um, and we're delighted to welcome him back uh, to talk to us about the award-winning Yorkshire Turtle Dove Project. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Nick. That's great. Okay, so it's wonderful to be back talking to you uh, after uh, two years, and it's great to see so many familiar faces uh, straight away recognising you all this morning, to this evening, which was lovely. Uh, as Nick said, uh, the last time I saw you, I was talking about the North Yorkshire, North York Moors National Park. And then when you came to visit the previous summer, uh, we were in the National Park. And at that time in 2017, I just started working as the North Yorkshire Turtle Dove Project Officer. And it was a new part time job, uh, two days a week. Uh, funded by Heritage Lottery and it, the extension of the contract was for three years so the, the project was for three years funding and it all come about really uh, uh, because I'd set up the North Yorkshire Turtle project in 2016 as a voluntary project so I'd set it up without any kind of idea that it could lead to a part-time job and get some big funding uh, only a year previous to, to 2017 and I'd set it up because uh, I was very aware of our population of European turtle doves in what we call the Great Yorkshire Forest. So the Great Yorkshire Forest is Dolby Forest, Wycombe Forest, Langdale Forest. Basically if you will look on a map and you look on a map between Scarborough and Helmsley the North York Lewis Park Southern Fringe, so the landscape along the southern edge of the National Park from east to west between Scarborough and Helmsley, there's a large forest and it's a really, really big forest, almost unbroken, uh, moving all the way across 40 miles between Scarborough and Helmsley. And I was aware at the time that, that we had a relatively good population of turtle doves in those forests. I was also aware at the time that nationally in 2016, I was acutely aware that nobody south of Yorkshire really knew anything about our population of turtle doves. I was aware that they were becoming rarer and I've spoken to a lot of bird watchers involved in ringing birds in the forest, surveying birds, the response when I said we should do something about turtle doves, we should work with Natural England, RSPB, the response was they're not interested, uh, the, the, you know, they're more interested in, in the south of England birds, not really interested in our birds. So I was determined to change this. Uh, when you say something like that to me, then it, it just makes me uh, even more determined to sort of uh, open the world up to, to our population of turtle doves. So I set up this project as a volunteer in 2016. I had a group of friends, about a dozen friends, and we all went out and started serving turtle doves. And we had really good results. And then the National Park saw what we were doing and applied for a Heritage Lottery Fund grant. And I had to apply for the job as the project officer because I'd set it up. And thankfully, I got it. <laughs> and the rest is history, really. So. 
we've been running the project uh, for nearly five years, since 2016. Five survey years we've had, uh, five summers. Now, um, this talk is really good because uh, we've now got more data than ever before. And I think this talk is probably, every time I do this talk, it, it's hopefully more informative and better than the previous time because we're getting more data all the time. So the project has now ended from the point of view of funding. So my paid job has ended, but there was no way I was going to stop this project. Uh, so I'm continuing now as a volunteer. So I'm back to working as a volunteer. And I told all the volunteers working with us, we've had about 80 volunteers over the five years, that once the funding ends and my paid job ends, then we're continuing uh, the project. There's no way I was going to sort of step down. So we're back to being a volunteer project now. And the final thing I wanted to say as the introduction was that uh, the fee for tonight um, from your naturalist uh, history group is going towards the Turtle Dove project because we're fundraising now as a volunteer project. So all of that fee is going into Turtle Dove conservation. Okay, that's a, a long introduction. Hopefully you're still around and haven't fallen asleep. So what I wanted to do in this talk tonight was introduce turtle doves as a species, identifying turtle doves, what do they look like, what's the best things to look for, their European and UK conservation status, how many have we got left uh, in Europe, uh, what's their status from the point of view of uh, the, the population, what's gone wrong for turtle doves, why they're in such a perilous state, uh, their incredible migration because they're an amazing migrant, uh, African migrant. And then most importantly, the second part of the talk is what are we doing to help? Uh, habitat conservation that we've been carrying out for the past four years in the projects area. And then the final part of the talk is going to be completely different almost, but very, very strongly linked with turtle doves. A little story about uh, my trip to Israel to raise money for uh, Champions of the Flyway in March 2018. And that uh, trip really opened my eyes, unfortunately, to the amount of illegal hunting on the flyway. But it's a very positive story. And really important for anybody who wants to visit the National Park in the future, where can you see turtle doves in the National Park? So a few top tips on where to look out for them. So that's what I'm going to do in the talk and what we're going to sort of talk about. Save up your questions at the end and when Nick introduces it, then I'm more than happy to take lots of questions and have a, a general discussion at the end. So importantly, starting off, what does a turtle dove look and sound like? The, the smallest uh, dove in Europe, if there's a turtle dove sat next to a collared dove, you would notice the difference. However, for anybody who's seen a turtle dove on its own, you'll probably remember that it's difficult when they're on their own to sort of notice the difference in size between that and a collared dove. But when they're together, it's very obvious. When a turtle dove sits next to a wood pigeon, it's even more obvious. It looks tiny next to a huge wood pigeon. They arrive from Africa in April and leave in September, and the male has a unique purring song. Anybody who's heard Turtle Dove will never forget the beautiful, soporific purring song of a Turtle Dove. There's nothing else like it in Europe. Uh, it probably the only bird which is similar is maybe a nightjar, but that's much harsher, very uh, hard metallic churring noise of a nightjar, whereas turtle dove is very soft, very similar to a long cat purr. They have black and white stripes on the neck, and as a Newcastle football fan, I'm very keen on their black and white stripes, uh, but that's not the reason I love turtle doves, but I can't take my eye off their black and white stripes, I must admit. Very distinctive feature, uh, only bird in Europe that has those distinctive black and white stripes on the neck. Black and orange spangling feathers on the mantle and the wings 
on the closed wing, very distinctive again. A pink flush on the breast, most noticeable in, in the summer really, when they're fluffing the chest up, especially the males. When they do fluff the chest up and they're singing, then there's a contrast between the pink breast and the whiter belly, which you can't quite see on this bird, but that does come about when you when you see them singing, they puff up their, their chest and, and, and there's a bit of a contrast between the, the chest and the belly. When they're in flight, there's a really distinctive diamond shaped black and white tail. If you watch collared doves in your garden, you'll notice that there's a two-toned tail on collared dove. There's a contrast between the upper tail and the outer feathers of a collared dove's tail, but it's nowhere near as strikingly black and white as turtle dove. And this is the most important feature, I think, for noticing and identifying recording turtle doves. In our forests in North Yorkshire and in many other parts of England where we still get turtle doves, they can be very shy birds, especially in forests. They're much shyer in the forests than they are uh, in people's gardens. We get them in villages in the National Park when they're coming down to feed on the ground in somebody's garden. They tend to be much easier to see and more approachable which isn't a good thing from a predation point of view but the birds that are in the forest they're really shy and often the first thing you see or that you only see is the black and white tail so that's a really important feature if you get used to the collared dove tail as soon as you see a black and white turtle dove tail you'll know straight away because they're much more contrasting so those are the most important features for a, a turtle dove. Their conservation status, they're what we call red listed. That means of highest conservation concern. Uh, there's a number of UK birds which are red listed, birds such as skylark, song thrush, but those birds are not in such peril as turtle doves, thankfully. Their regional status, so it's a massive, fast decline, and they are genuinely at high risk of extinction in Europe uh, if we don't do something about it. So what's gone wrong for turtle doves? Uh, their food supply has diminished over the past uh, 50 to 100 years. They feed solely on small seeds, tiny seeds. Anybody putting out food in their garden and lucky enough to get a turtle dove coming on to uh, into the garden to feed will know that the tent the biggest thing they tend to take is is a, a whole sunflower seed but they do like millet seed and tiny tiny wildflower seed chickweed fumitory you know we're talking very small seed really uh, the disease now the problem with the food of course before moving on to disease the food has changed dramatically. We've got a lot less wildflowers in the countryside. We've had uh, the intensification of farming has meant that we've lost lots of edge habitats around fields, which used to have bird, uh, flowers such as fumitory, bird's foot trefoil, chickweed, fat hen, all of these species we consider wildflowers, but uh, many farmers would consider them weeds uh, and this type of habitat has declined and been lost almost completely in the wider countryside. So that has really reduced the amount of food feeding opportunities for turtle doves. The disease problems has been um, caused partly because of the decline in food. Uh, what's happened is turtle doves that are still around uh, depend on, are becoming more dependent on cereal seed. So at the end of the summer, uh, prior to the harvest, uh, turtle doves do really like feeding on uh, seeds such as oilseed rape. The tiny, tiny oilseed rape seeds are quite popular for turtle dove. Uh, and other birds such as linnets <coughs> love oilseed rape seed. So that has led them into uh, farmyards and uh, obviously into people's gardens. And in people's gardens, and in farmyards is much uh, greater risk of disease. So the migration hazards, at the end of this four um, points of, 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 of struggle for turtle doves, 
you, you, you just end up thinking, I can't believe there's actually any left. It's quite incredible that we've still got uh, birds around because there's so many problems that they face. Turtle doves complete a round trip of uh, 11,000 kilometers each year to Africa and back. And on this journey, there's many hunting hazards. Uh, in France, in Spain, uh, those are the two countries that, that uh, harvest, if that's what you want to call it, uh, the largest number of birds. The illegal um, hunting in France uh, is, is a problem, but even more of a problem is illegal hunting. So the migration hazards are really, really big problem for turtle doves. The wintering habitat in Africa, uh, the decline in habitat quality and change in the wintering grounds uh, is a problem. And you'll see later in the talk how important water is for turtle doves. And with the desertification uh, problems in Africa, uh, climate change, if there's less water availability in their wintering quarters, then that's another uh, problem that they can, they can face. So quite a list of, of challenges for this beautiful bird. So a little bit on migration now. It's really uh, a fantastic thing to celebrate. It's really an incredible journey. And the best description of this journey we've got is a male turtle dove, which was uh, satellite tagged by the RSPB in Suffolk in 2014. He was nicknamed Titan. <coughs> And over the next two years after he was satellite tagged, the RSPB put together this wonderful uh, journey, wonderful um, story of, of his migration. He left his breeding area close to the same day in both autumns. So the 19th of September in 2014 and 2015, close to that same day. Uh, that's a really interesting date for us because that's almost exactly the same time that we tend to see our last turtle doves. So the records we get in the North York Lewis National Park tend to be, there's, there's no October records. Occasionally we get one at the end of September, but most of them have gone by the middle of September. So that's pretty typical departure date for England. In 2015, Titan returned to the same breeding site in Suffolk. And he used the same site each winter in Mali, landing only four kilometers away from where he was the previous year. So that's an amazing uh, ability for turtle doves to navigate to almost precisely where they were breeding the previous year <clears throat> and almost exactly where uh, they were spending the winter. And that 11,000 round trip, 11,000 kilometer round trip. The site fidelity, as we know, uh, as we call it, site fidelity of turtle doves is really important. They're relatively long-lived birds and they're monogamous and they tend to return to the same area, the same site. Uh, that is, can be a massive advantage if your habitat is of good quality and if your habitat is, is big enough and of scale you know you've got really good habitat to return to, so a better chance of being successful. However, it can be a real problem if the habitat changes over a period of time. So I think for me, this is the one big problem within Europe, and especially this country, is that we've had turtle doves for the past 50 years returning to areas that they've traditionally bred in successfully, and over a period of several years, that habitat will have been destroyed, changed, removed, and, and it's just not suitable anymore. And these turtle doves then will have real difficulty in sort of relocating uh, to the extent that they need to. So the, the, their site fidelity can be a big advantage, but it can cause uh, big problems when there's big habitat change over a period of time. So moving on now, that was a bit of a background to turtle doves identification and the problems that they face. So I'm going to get very local now and talk about our North Yorkshire turtle dove project area. So this map uh, shows our project area. Uh, it was drawn by the ecologist for the National Park when she applied for the grant. Thankfully, we all sat down and I remember 
uh, helping to draw the project area when we applied to the National Lottery in 2016. And we, what we wanted to do was encompass most of the records, the traditional sites for turtle doves. So this drain shape has 99% of all the turtle doves in the north of England within it. It's a very, very isolated population. Uh, turtle doves are virtually extinct in East Yorkshire. So to the south of this line, uh, we're getting into the Yorkshire Wolds. Uh, 50 years ago, they used to be relatively common in the Yorkshire Wolds. Uh, now there's less than six pairs. To the north of the project's area, in the north, uh, northern part of the North York Lewis National Park around the Gisborough Forests and Teesside where I grew up. There used to be a small numbers of birds, but they've gone completely, gone completely from Northumberland. I think in the last four or five years, there's been kind of one turtle dove seen every year in Northumberland, so just one bird. So, and west, west of us, there's, there's virtually no records either. So we really, we have this very isolated population, which is almost certainly the furthest north in Europe as well. So that brings its own challenges uh, for turtle doves because they're, they're so isolated. But you can see on this map, you can see the wonderful uh, forests closer to Scarborough. We've got Dolby Forest over towards, uh, towards Scarborough, uh, north of Pickering, and Cropton Forest is really important uh, near Appleton Lynn Moors and then Langdale and Wycombe Forest. And then over towards Helmsley, there's uh, the area of Sutton Bank. And then into the Hawardian Hills, down towards Yore. So the area that you can see, anybody been to Castle Howard before in the Hawardian Hills? There used to be a relatively good population in that area, but there's a lot less now than there used to be. So we've got a wonderful area to work in. It's about 100,000 hectares. Uh, uh, it's a large project area, but it does encompass all our turtle doves. So when we started the project, we had our new area, we had our project area defined, which was important, where I was going to actually work uh, with farmers and, and communities. And what we wanted to do quite quickly is look at the historical records look at where the concentrations of birds were. What we did find was there's never been a turtle dove survey, so nobody had ever surveyed turtle doves as a single species. So to try and pick out records was a real detective job. Uh, I, I love doing that, it's a really interesting thing to do, but you've got to have the knowledge of where to go, all sorts of places from uh, the BTO records to uh, local bird groups to natural history groups. It was a real detective uh, job to put all this together. And those were, each, each yellow dot is not a single bird, it's where there were potentially several records over many years. Um, so there could be actually quite a lot of birds involved in those uh, yellow dots, but it gives us a distribution of where most of them were. So that was the first job when we, when we started the project. <clears throat> then we had to do uh, to actually design our methodology. So to survey turtle doves as a single species had not been done many times before. The RSPB luckily had just started uh, lots of their surveys within the last 10 years, Operation Turtle Dove, and they have been fantastic as an organisation. Lots of friends working in Suffolk and Kent and other parts of England and they've helped put together the methodology to make sure that we were using the same method as they were. So I cribbed a lot of their uh, method and our formal surveys take part, take place. Uh, two visits uh, in the spring and the summer, one visit between May and the middle of June and then second visit between the middle of June and the end of July. So there's two visits. Uh, which everybody says that's fine, I can make that, so there's no, not a problem from a time point of view. But the thing that I was worried about, the thing that, that I love doing, and uh, that I was worried that people wouldn't really want to do, was you have to get up at or near dawn, you have to actually be on your site at or near dawn. So if you live 50 miles away, you'd have to actually get up at 
you know, two o'clock in the morning to be able to be in the forest at four o'clock in the morning. So I was slightly worried that this might put people off. The opposite experience was true. Uh, lots and lots of people have loved that. Uh, it's become a kind of USP of the project. Uh, lots of people want to take part because they want to be out in the forest at dawn. It's a wonderful time to be out. Your fantastic birding opportunities is the best time of day. So that's kind of how we do the surveys, two, two survey visits to a one kilometre square. Uh, but what we wanted to do, it's worth mentioning this, is really important, is right at the beginning of the project, I wanted to give our casual records, as we call them, or additional records, equal importance to target conservation action. So we have our formal records in one set of data and our casual records. So casual records would be if somebody was driving through the National Park and saw a turtle, they'll send the record to the project. So we wanted to give those records uh, equal importance, really. So these are a couple of maps I want to show you. This is what we actually do with our data. So we've got uh, big spreadsheets which uh, are compiled every year and everybody's record of turtle dove goes into the spreadsheet. And over the course of the spring and the summer, any sniff that of somebody has seen a turtle dove, I'm all over it. I'm contacting them. Somebody says, oh, I think I, was, I bumped into somebody who saw a turtle dove, that I'm trying to find out who that person was, because my job is to try and get as many records as possible to work out where they all are and to give us a good idea of the population. <clears throat> so over the course of the five years of the project, uh, this is where all our casual records have come from. So again, this is not single birds, there may be more birds within each uh, circle. So this gives you an idea again of the distribution. So you can see straight away that the distribution now is no different really to 1997. So in that space of time, these birds are returning to almost exactly the same locations and there's virtually no difference. Uh, the odd bird uh, to the north of the project area but uh, again, 95, 99% of them are all within that area. Same areas they've been for many, many years. Very sight faithful birds they are. These uh, maps, by the way, have just come back from the local ecological data centre uh, in York last week. So first people, you are the first people to see them. So I was very pleased. Uh, the timing of the talk tonight is excellent because we got lots of new data back. Uh, last week. And again, hot off the press, this is our results of uh, all our records this year. So the purple dots are the casual records this year, and the orange squares are where we had the uh, formal surveys. <clears throat> so what we do with the formal surveys is we mapped lots of areas across the project area, and we've carried out surveys in hundreds of different one kilometer squares over the last five years. But we've kept 25 of those squares as monitoring squares. So we go back to those squares, those 25 squares every year. And we try and have the same people serving those squares every year to make sure that we carry on monitoring those squares. So each one kilometer square is a monitoring square. And we want to know how the population is changing uh, within those squares. And that has been the most fascinating thing. Um, and especially when somebody takes on a square and there's turtle doves in their square, they really want to hold on to that square. You, be, you become very, very attached to your particular square, as I, I have become very attached to my, to my square in Cropton Forest. Uh, it's really funny, actually, because when, when we started the project in 2016, we had lots of maps on the table when people came to choose their areas to survey. And I did the right thing. I did the best thing I could possibly do. Let everybody choose them first. And then I came in and said, oh, I'll have that one. And it was random. Nobody believes that it was a random choice about my one kilometer square, because since we started the project, I've had the most turtle doves in my square than anybody else. <laughs> so it's been an absolutely incredible journey. Uh, 
Uh, we still had a lot of turtle doves in that square this year, which I was very, very pleased to see. So I've been very lucky with the, the choice of that square. So now, how many turtle doves make it to North Yorkshire? So again, this is, I, was, I just put together this slide yesterday because yesterday my uh, copy of British Birds arrived. So uh, I was able to put together two, two um, slides to show you exactly where we are with the population, which, which, I was, which is very exciting to do. So the formal surveys this year, we had uh, 33 singing males in 21 kilometer survey squares. Uh, so of the 20 that we managed to survey, 50% of them, just over 50% had turtle doves, which was a very good result. And the casual records uh, were quite good. And over the course of the five years, there's 874 birds uh, submit to the project. Uh, but many of those birds may be repeated uh, records. Uh, total of 86 singing males in 2020. So this year we had 86 singing males. That's a mix, that's a combination of the formal surveys and the casual records. And over the five years, the number of singing males has con been consistently between 50 and 100 birds. We've surveyed 175 uh, one kilometer squares and we've sampled uh, over a third of the project area and conducted over 1,000 volunteer hours. So we've conducted a huge number of surveys uh, and it's really made a massive difference. So the question that lots of people have been asking me for the past four or five years is how does our Yorkshire population compare with other counties? And until yesterday, I could not answer that. So when my copy of British Birds magazine came through the post, I thought, ah, the rare breeding birds report for 2018 should be in it. So I quickly looked through and I was, first of all, I was, I was very concerned to see that they'd included our turtle dove numbers. So that was a massive relief. But this was the first time I'd ever had an opportunity to look at the statistics for other counties in England. So I was really, really interested in the results. So I just put together this slide yesterday, thinking this is great timing again. So Kent is the best county for turtle doves, 158 singing males, 158 pairs, I should say. Suffolk came second and Yorkshire came third. So you can imagine I had a bit of a cheer there. It was a, a strange thing to cheer about because across the whole of England, uh, 615 and an estimated 1,194 pairs of turtle doves now. So the reason they've now been uh, classified as a rare breeding bird in the UK is because they've dipped below 2,000 birds or 2,000 pairs. Uh, any birds that dip below that uh, figure of 2,000 immediately become classified as a rare breeding bird. So now in the report, turtle doves are in the same report as things like golden orioles, uh, some of the very rare birds, uh, which is very sad really because they've changed their status dramatically. But I was very, it was a dual feeling really when I read that yesterday. I was very pleased to see uh, Yorkshire up there and beating Norfolk by three, even better. And uh, it was really fascinating to see, to see uh, which counties had uh, turtle doves. And we're so isolated in, in our area, uh, but it's just fantastic to be actually recognized uh, within, within the uh, suite of, of, of turtle dove areas of the country. So what do we actually do with this data? There's no point collecting data for rare breeding birds if you actually don't make the situation better. In 2016, when I started the surveys with my friends and volunteers, I wanted to move very quickly. I told everybody we've got to move very quickly to having collected data to create habitat for turtle dove, to restore habitat, to make some conservation gain, as they say. And we have done that very, very quickly, much quicker than I could have ever imagined, really. Uh, with the data that we've, we've had, the North and East Yorkshire Data Centre 
put together lots of different layers within GIS, mapping system. They put together habitat features that were suitable for turtle doves, such as where the water is, where the forestry is. Uh, then they put together things such as agri-environment schemes, so where there's an environmental scheme nearby. So that creates an opportunity to approach a farmer to help habitat. And also, most importantly, where our turtle doves were, the records from the past five years. And they put all these layers together within GIS uh, software system and immediately created uh, 58 key squares, which was a gold dust for, for me as a project salary officer going out to speak to farmers. That really nailed where the most important areas are to, to speak to farmers. And this is where we want to create the best habitat possible for turtle doves. It also works really well from the point of view of a bird which is so site faithful. You don't want to be creating habitat where there may have been one record of turtle dove within the last 10 years. That's really pointless because it's not going to do them any good. You need to be focusing in, uh, in their site faithful areas. So now we've got those 58 squares. Uh, we can really, we really wanted to sort of move ahead with uh, a new system of, of creating and restoring habitat. So I wanted to just give you an overview of the habitat for turtle doves. So there's no point wanting to create habitat and restoring habitat if you don't know the type of habitat that they actually require. So not surprisingly, food, water and nesting habitat, that's their requirements. Within that, uh, water, I'll mention that first with our dew pond up on, on the top of the uh, slide there, which needs restoring. So that's a, I like that photograph because it, it gives you as an opportunity. This is a, an old dew pond uh, originally created uh, in this, at this farm up near Sutton Bank uh, in the National Park for cattle to drink from. But many dew ponds have become don't supply water now because they've not been managed over many, many years. So turtle doves need water far more than, than other birds because they create a milk, they make a milk within, milk within a, a crop, which they actually feed the young uh, in the nest. So when they've got very tiny chicks, when they've hatched, uh, they uh, feed the young on a milk. So they can only create the milk with water and the seeds. So that's a really important uh, aspects of their uh, life cycle. The food, uh, the, the slide to uh, next to the, the, the pond slide, uh, this is uh, a, an area of, of great turtle dove habitat. One of my jobs um, with farmers uh, and land managers was is to raise their awareness of what looks a good habitat for turtle doves and other birds. Uh, this is uh, an arable field which has a, an area which has been tilled, disked uh, into an area where pioneering uh, flowers such as fumitory, chickweed, all sorts of other uh, birdfoot trefoils, uh, species such as that can grow. And in that kind of sward, in that open ground, these pioneer plants will thrive. And that's what turtle doves love. Turtle doves don't like to, to walk around in amongst high vegetation. They like open vegetation. They like open ground, gravelly ground, bare earth, where they can pick at the seeds and also see uh, any danger coming. A little bit like waders, a little bit like lapwings and curlews. They need an open aspect. So to the untrained eye, that area, uh, of, of open ground and bare earth may look like a wasteland or a, an area that's not being used, but for turtle doves, it's absolutely wonderful. That's exactly what they like. So that's the type of habitat we wanted to create to provide food. The bottom two slides are two slides showing their nesting habitat. So the big bank of scrub near the wildflower meadow, uh, that big bank of scrub is the traditional nesting habitat for turtle doves. So especially in the southeast of England and especially in Kent, uh, most of their turtle doves are nesting in this type of habitat. We do have turtle doves nesting in this type of habitat in North Yorkshire, 
but our best areas, our most concentrated part of the population, nest in commercial forests. Now, if you told me when I was uh, studying nature conservation in 1987, uh, when I was uh, studying nature conservation at a forestry college in uh, the Lake District, if you told me that uh, in 2020 I would be extolling the, the wonderful virtues of commercial forestry, I would not have believed you. I would have thought you were completely mad. In those days, all commercial forestry was bad. Uh, there was all of the problems with the uh, flow country and the tax breaks. Uh, that, that were taken by people to plant up massive areas of valuable habitat. However, uh, these uh, habitats have become extremely valuable to some birds, uh, especially turtle doves. Turtle doves, I think, are looking at spruce and larch plantation, such as this photograph, and they're looking at it and they're thinking, if it's of a, of a good age, if it's of the right density of branches and needles, then it's exactly the same as nesting in scrub. There's very little difference. It's all about volume. It's about how you can place your nest within the branches. And if it gives them the same volume of twigs and, and, and branches than a scrub, then what's the difference to turtle doves? Especially as in, on the continent in Europe, many of the turtle doves historically have nested in this type of habitat. And of course, uh, lots of native spruce forests over there. This photograph of the commercial forestry with the forestry track running through it. This is a photograph of my one kilometer square in Cropton that I won't let anybody else survey. I've surveyed it now for five years and it's the best uh, square in the whole of the project area for turtle doves. So this, this really produces the birds. Um, so it's, it's got everything this square really. It's got water, it's got wildflower edges on the tracks and it's got this, the right age of, of forestry. So that's what turtle doves need uh, in the national park. So we, we needed a system to actually persuade landowners, persuade farmers, landowners to create the right habitat, to sow the right species of flowers. And we needed uh, to encourage them to do that. The only way to get them to do that was is to pay a grant. So we created a unique grant. There's no other grant in the country dedicated just to turtle doves. The RSPB used lots of stewardship scheme uh, uh, structures to provide their habitats with exactly the same uh, specification. So the same flowers, the same mixes and everything. But we were lucky to set up, we set up our own grants. So we don't depend on stewardship schemes, which is really useful because trying to set up a stewardship scheme can take months and months. With this small grant, I was able to go out to a farmer with the paperwork one day, get his signature the same day, the next day it's all done and dusted. It's just really simple. And farmers love that. Farmers really enjoy that, that lack of bureaucracy and contact with a local uh, project officer. So this is the type of areas we are creating, uh, open ground, and hopefully lots of flowers for turtle doves. And the southern warm aspect is good near a hedge, uh, a field boundary. Woodland edges aren't so good because you tend to have uh, enrichment of soil and shade. Although this is the type of habitat we created. And we were quite successful at doing that and paying farmers annually over six years to create that habitat. So when we actually started creating these habitats and, and thinking about the grants, again, I used the expertise of the RSPB, which was invaluable. Operation Turtle Dove, which I'm ho hopefully some of you have heard of. I went down to Cambridgeshire and had a wonderful couple of days there looking at different farms to see what they've been doing. And this was a great farm that had created a wonderful area for turtle doves, a large field full of their favorite food, which is common fumitory. So common fumitory, uh, I've took this photograph in May 2018, and already then it was bearing seeds. So as fumitory flowers and seeds constantly throughout the summer, uh, turtle doves have a seed source, uh, even when they return from, from Africa. Unfortunately, now fumitory 
is nowhere near as common as it used to be in the countryside. And in fact, many agron agronomists are recommending that farmers spray it out at the same time as we're giving grants to try to get people to actually plant it and, and grow it, which is um, one of the crazy things of working in nature conservation. But this is what fumatory looks like worth looking out for uh, in the spring and the summer uh, in arable fields. So again, this is, um, th this is the kind of uh, habitat we wanted to create. So creating these wildflower plots, we wanted to show farmers the structure, the type of plot that's successful. There's no point growing a big, beautiful meadow with two foot high flowers, because this is what turtle doves want. And this is taken in on the 9th of July 2017 with a trail camera with an automatically uh, uh, automatic camera going off. And this must have been a wonderful thing for their project officer to see Operation Turtle Dove because they've not only got an adult in the background, but they've actually got a juvenile. So a wonderful, uh, wonderful thrill uh, to see that uh, photograph for the farmer as well, because it's exactly the type of habitat that, that turtle doves love. It's got bare earth at the, at the front, but you can see that that perfect height and loads of flowers, birds foot trefoil, white clover, there's off probably chickweed in there and other things that they're feeding on. So we were very successful at bringing uh, farmers into the grant and uh, I, I managed to supply advice to 65 farms and lots of like, interested landowners uh, over the course of the, the, the three years that we had the funding. And some farms I went to visit, uh, I, I remember this very, very clearly. In fact, this farm is on the turtle dove video, the project video we created, uh, which I'll send a link to Janet for um, um, tomorrow, so Janet can, can um, send it around to everybody, anybody who's interested in watching the project video. This farm was on the, in the video. And I went to see this farm in 2018 because I was really keen to get the farmer into the to the grant. And he said, oh, I think I've got an area we could we could change, we could improve and plant some flowers. I'll take you to see it. So I went to see it and it's it was already full of fumatory. So <laughs> that was a that was a real shock, a very nice surprise. Uh, so we managed to talk about how to manage that field. Uh, to, to ensure that that type of habitat was still there for fumatory to grow. Uh, the farmer hadn't realised that it was, it was full of the, exactly the right types of flowers uh, for turtle doves. So over the course of the uh, few years that we've, that we've managed to get some farms in, we had uh, 30 plots uh, covering 12 hectares, a few more in 2020. But we were very successful in a very short space of time at creating the habitat, creating the new structure of the grant. But this is just scratching the surface. We really need to build up that scale. We really only just, just scratched the surface with the amount of habitat, uh, a very small uh, amount of habitat, but far more than we thought we were going to. So we need to up that scale now uh, in future years to really make a difference for turtle doves. So that's the kind of North Yorkshire turtle dove uh, project perspective. And uh, I've, this is the, the sort of third of the talk. Uh, we're going to move now to Israel. Uh, in 2017, as an introduction to this part of the uh, talk, I want to mention that I did a North Yorkshire turtle dove talk at a little village uh, in North Yorkshire with a community group. And I talked about the problem of illegal hunting in the talk. And then at the end of the talk, uh, a lady put her hand up and said, well, what are you doing about the illegal hunting? And, I, and she was very strident with her question, which I was kind of taken aback because usually you get very polite questions. Uh, but it was a wonderful thing for her to ask. And she was dead right. What are we doing about that illegal hunting? And thankfully at the time, I'd already had discussions with a friend of mine, Mark, about entering uh, a very exciting competition called Champions of the Flyway. Champions of the Flyway are based in Israel and they are a partner of BirdLife International. 
And Champions of Flyway have a, a, a donated projects that they donate all of their money to every year. And a lot of that money goes towards conservation. A lot of it goes towards, all of it goes towards conservation. Education is a really big part of it. And this is what we want to stop, really. This bottom photograph, really shocking. Beaters, turtle doves, golden orioles, lesser grey shrikes, quails, all sorts of beautiful birds of the Mediterranean. And the top photograph is a, an advocate uh, and, a, and a, a gamekeeper turned conservationist talking to a hunter, trying to uh, bring them into conservation rather than hunting. And birds that have no borders, so we need conservation without borders. So we entered a team in 2018, uh, me and three very close friends, uh, birders, conservationists, and a, a, a European uh, artist uh, based in, in Edinburgh, Darren Woodhead, four of us in the team. We wanted to enter into this uh, bird race to try and win the trophy. Why did we do it? Well, 25 million birds uh, of 450 species that are killed illegally, taken alive in the Mediterranean every year. 20 locations in the Mediterranean are responsible for 8 million birds. And European turtle dove, big numbers, uh, killed every year. But really importantly, we need to recognise some of the things that we consider as British birds, such as song thrush, uh, non-migrants, but huge numbers are killed every year. And 100% of the funds uh, goes to fund uh, a species cause every year. And it's an amazing, incredible event to take part in. And this is a map to show you, this is a BirdLife International map to show you which are the worst countries and which are the best countries. And you can see one of the reasons that BirdLife International have this big event, Champions of the Flyway in Israel, one of the main reasons is because it's the only green country on this map uh, where virtually no birds are killed uh, or killed in trivial numbers. The rest of the countries, uh, uh, there could be a big problem, especially Egypt and Italy uh, and Syria. So that's where the, the problems are. So what's one of the reasons that they hold it in Israel? This is another reason. Uh, it's a wonderful country for birding. Uh, some people listening tonight may have been to Israel birding or uh, for other types of natural history in the past. Wonderful place to go. The map here shows really well the migration routes. So our turtle doves, the European turtle doves nesting in England, are the left-hand uh, red arrows, as I'm looking at the screen. So our turtle doves on that 11,000 kilometer round trip uh, wintering in, um, in Mali and Senegal. They're using this uh, Western African flyway back up through the Straits of Gibraltar when they return in spring and then back down more or less the same route. So that's our total of route. Then we've got the Central African route crossing the, the, the parts of Mediterranean which take them over quite risky places. And then this amazing migration, which Elat finds itself in a kind of pinch point up through the valleys, because the birds do not want to travel across the wide part of the Mediterranean. They all shift towards the Red Sea and come up through Israel. And you have this incredible migration corridor. So the combination of the lack of hunting and this amazing migration uh, makes Israel the best place for the World Cup of Bird Races every spring. An incredible migration, just one, one sort of example of that was uh, 6,000 step buzzards before lunch one day and uh, sharp eyed amongst you will spot that these are all step buzzards apart from one bird right in the middle, which is a step eagle uh, out, out sizing the rest of them. Uh, incredible raptor migration. So we put together our team. We called our team uh, the Yorkshire Terriers. This is our team. There's me, Jono, Mark with a beard, and Darren. Darren Woodhead, somebody who hopefully have heard of Darren's amazing artwork. All originally born in Yorkshire, really important. And we wanted to win the Guardians Trophy. 
the gap there's two trophies two main trophies in the bird race there's the guardians of the flyway and the champions of the flyway champions of the flyway are the team that see the most species on race day and the guardians of the flyway are the team that we that raise the most money for the conservation cause that was the, the the trophy we wanted to win we weren't really interested in the bird race trophy we wanted to do some amazing birding but we didn't really uh, have that competitive edge. We we're probably all a bit old as well, to be honest, to be racing around for 24 hours. The incredible uh, coming together of different communities. On this photograph, we've got Israelis, Palestinians uh, from Syria and Jordan. So four countries that don't necessarily always mix together as a community, amazing coming together of, of community. And of course, Mark from, from Yorkshire. You can spot Mark because he's the, he's the palest skin, uh, the, the peakiest face amongst, amongst the birders there. Uh, so amazing community friendship. I, I've never done anything like this and uh, it was quite a, a thrill to be part of. So before the bird race, everybody gets together, shares information, makes a list of the things they can see, Everybody uh, tells each other where the best places are to go. There's a real generous spirit. And on, uh, on race day and prior to that, we went out for a week. We were sponsored uh, to, to do the bird race by Zeiss Optics and lots of different sponsorship we managed to get to raise money. We saw some incredible birds. Uh, there's this magic pumpkin field which had lots of fantastic birds in and this is one of the best birds we saw during the week a blue cheek beater and you can see Jono pointing there and you can see the tiny bird up on the wire and this is this is the, the same bird which uh, had flown down into a, a bush later on so we had an amazing time birding and we won the Guardians of the Flyway trophy we raised twice as much as any other team uh, had ever done before we never thought we would we would raise so much we raised twenty eight thousand dollars uh, on on the uh, in in the period of time prior to the bird race, we were all over social media. We were trying to get as much money together as possible, and we really smashed it. And we were very very proud. It was like winning the, the FA Cup. Uh, it's the closest I'm ever going to get to winning the FA Cup. <laughs> That's for certain. We were like big kids again up on the on the stage. There was this really posh hotel with hundreds of people there from all over the world. So it was quite emotional. And this is, the, uh, this is the photograph of all the teams together. That particular year, the money went to BirdLife Croatia and Serbia, which is a big check down there. Nearly $100,000 was raised for, for BirdLife Croatia and Serbia. And these are the winning teams, including the, the, the young team at the back, whose uh, father managed to drive them around on bird race day. So an incredible event. And it really highlighted to me, working on the Turtle Dove project, it really highlighted the importance of working across borders. We cannot hope to make a difference for turtle doves and other migrant species unless we work across borders as communities as close together as possible. It's just not going to happen. We just, we're just never going to be able to achieve anything. That particular year, 2018, uh, the European quail was the focus species, but I managed to get £2,000 out of the National Park, where I was working at the time, uh, to that, that sponsorship pot. So £2,000 actually came out of the conservation budget because I made a direct link to uh, turtle doves. So that was a, a real great uh, thrill to actually get them to sponsor us. Since that time, we've had other people step forward and some of you may have heard of uh, a famous birder called Johnny Rankin. Johnny Rankin and Nick Moran. Nick Moran, who works for the British Trust for Ornithology, they uh, did a bike ride from Thetford to Spurn Bird Observatory in 2019 and raised £3,000 for our uh, Turtle Dove project, which was a wonderful achievement. Three grand uh, straight into our conservation pot, every penny spent on on conservation and we won the project for the best conservation project in UK National Parks uh, in 2019 
Uh, we had a big art project at the same time. Uh, we raised £8,000 for the Turtle Dove project at that time. So lots of famous artists came forward, donated pieces of work, and we auctioned them uh, on our art projects, desperately trying to raise as much money as possible for, for, the, for the conservation pot. So moving on now, that has been about fundraising, uh, how we've been doing it in the last few years. So moving on now to future opportunities. Some of you will have heard, hopefully most of you have heard of the wonderful news about beavers in the past 10 years at different parts of the UK. We received our first beavers three years ago. And now we have breeding beavers within the enclosure of Cropton Forest, just north of Pickering. So they produced young uh, in 2020, still within an enclosure. And the hope is if it's successful, uh, we can, they can uh, take away the enclosure within the next five, five years or so. So beavers are gonna be fantastic news for turtle doves. More water and longer water retention in the forests are going to make better habitat for turtle doves. So there's a direct benefit there between direct link between beavers and turtle doves. When the beaver project uh, first heard me saying that, they were kind of taken aback. Uh, they didn't really expect that link to be so clear, but I always like to get beavers in the talk because they're really great news for all sorts of wildlife and especially turtle doves. So a couple of top tips before the last few um, beautiful slides that I want to show you. Where can you see turtle doves in North Yorkshire? The best two places in every year of the last five years really have been Sutton Bank National Park Visitor Centre uh, to the west of Helmsley, between Helmsley and Thirsk, right on the edge of the National Park. Sutton Bank National Park Visitor Centre has around five or six turtle doves every spring and early summer. Best time to go there is early morning before it gets busy. Uh, they come down to some of the feeders around the back of the visitor centre and they nest in the forests nearby. And then the other place to go, which I, I have even higher recommendation, is the Mill Inn, which is a tiny little old pub, uh, but a little tiny village called, in fact, it's more like a hamlet to the north of Scarborough, about six miles north of Scarborough, uh, called the Mill Inn. And it's a wonderful pub. In the past few years, there have been as many as five or six turtle doves there uh, on a single day. Uh, in the summer, late, from late May through to the end of July really is the best time. So there's about a 10 week period when you've got a good chance of seeing turtle doves. So if you Google the mill in, you'll find the address. I highly recommend the visit. And if you see turtle doves, please let me know. Because if I hear about anybody seeing turtle doves and they've not told me, you can imagine there's a wrath. And I wanted to finish with a few beautiful slides of turtle doves. Uh, I was very, very lucky to meet um, a birder barrister uh, a few years ago. Uh, Richard Bennett uh, works as a barrister in Middlesbrough and he's a birder. And not surprisingly, his Twitter handle is Borough Barrister. And he is a fantastic photographer. Very lucky to bump into him. He now does loads of surveys for me. Would, he loves turtle doves. And he showed me these photographs that he'd taken in 2014 at Sutton Bank. And I was absolutely blown away with them. I said, these are some of the best photographs of turtle doves ever taken. He was very lucky. He spent hours waiting for them to come down into these willows. And then he gave up, went into the cafe, sat down, had a cup of coffee. And of course, these two birds flew up and landed in the tree outside the window. And then amazingly, he managed to get these fantastic pictures uh, through the window, which was an even bigger achievement. So this is definitely my favourite uh, turtle dove video from our project area. Uh, you can see this is almost certainly the male on the right. Uh, this was, they were taken in May, so this courtship uh, going on between these two birds. Having come back from Africa, flown back from Africa, there's no doubt they're, they're re, um, re coming together uh, that bond social bond between the male and the female. That's a very delicate photograph. I really love this one. This is probably my favorite one. 
gets a bit more serious here. There's a bit of French kissing, so possibly French origin of these turtle doves in the past, maybe. It's definitely getting serious there. And as I move through these photographs, you can, you can imagine people in the past thought, what's coming next? But this is the final slide of the two of them just, just sat next to each other. Uh, almost certainly the male will probably be singing and, and uh, the hopefully uh, bred successfully that particular year. So we were very lucky uh, to have these photographs donated by Richard. And we've used them, you can imagine, in so many different places, especially Valentine's Day. Uh, when we want to promote projects. So that's our kind of final slide. Uh, I do have a National Park blog. Uh, we have a page in the National Park website for the Turtle Dove Project. Please have a look at that. Uh, the video actually is on, is on that page, but I'll send, I'll send uh, Janet the link and you can see updates on our project. Um, so hopefully you've enjoyed the, the talk and I'll uh, pass back to uh, Nick and please ask any questions at all about turtle doves, because I just love talking about turtle doves. Yeah, Jan, you go first. I'll start off. Um, I was noticing the, the graphs that you showed earlier on of the migration routes, and it um, made me wonder. Um, obviously, we're within the range of turtle doves. How, globally, how far north does their range extend? Well, I've not um, seen any specific data of breeding turtle doves uh, in Scandinavia, mm. but they used to breed commonly in Denmark. I don't know how far north they would have gone further north of Denmark. I wouldn't have thought they'd be going very much further north. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised as uh, if we have now the furthest north within Europe, if you draw a line between the North York Moose National Park and Scandinavia, I suspect, I don't think there'd be any further north than, than our birds. Mm. I think that's just about as far north as they go. Uh, and I'm not sure how many are left in Denmark. They've got real, very small population in the Netherlands. I met some turtle dove conservationists from there and it was quite shocking to hear the, the, the steep decline and how few birds they've got there. So, yeah, they've, um, apart from France and Spain, the most countries north of that have, have lost most of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, unmute yourself, uh, David Underwood, please. Off you go. Very interesting. Um, you talked about um, does like to go back to the same sort of area, um, and you've got these wonderful conservation groups where you've given grants to the farmers to create these um, habitat areas. What, what happens now the money's run out? What, what happens to those areas? Do, do the doves go, oh no, it's not there anymore? No, good question, David. I'm glad you've asked that question. I'm glad somebody asked that question. So uh, when we set up the grant, we were aware that we only had funding through Heritage Lottery for three years, but we wanted the grant to extend for longer than that. So we put together a six year period and the National Park committed to their budget to funding those grants beyond the end of the life of the lottery project. So if we didn't have any funding now, they would still be funded for another three years from now. So every grant plot gets funded for six years. However, we hope it's going to go on, on much further beyond six years because what we've got now is we've got the National Park Trust that are hopefully going to approve the project to move across to the Trust, which is a charity, and then we'll have a bank account and we can start fundraising. And we, the money in that bank account, the fundraising money, will go directly to set up new plots, new wildflower plots, new conservation, new. Uh, ponds. We're applying for another heritage lottery project next year, which will start working on uh, pond projects. So this will just keep moving, hopefully. Unfortunately, we live in a time and it's absolutely mad where you have to be constantly fighting for money to continue and, and sustain these conservation uh, areas. It would have been lovely if the National Lottery had given us 
10, 20 years worth of uh, conservation money, uh, but every every national lottery project is kind of three years, which is which is crazy really, because you can only really scratch the surface in that time. Um, but we're very very determined to 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 keep you know keep it increasing. Uh, once we've got an opportunity in a in a bank account with a charity attached to it, then I think we can we can raise a lot more money. Um, that's the plan. And, and can you appeal to the farmers' conscience at the end of this? Will they carry on without the money? Oh, well, um, some of them almost certainly will, because we the, the ones that we got in that were the keenest uh, were inevitably the ones that would, will do little bits themselves without anything. But we don't want to depend on that. We want, you know, we want to support them through the work because it is it is hard work. You do have to buy the wildflower mix. There's, there's a significant cost to that. There's a cost to the machinery and everything. So, you know, so, but yeah, a lot of the farmers are already doing little bits and pieces. In fact, it's really interesting because the conversations I had with most of the farmers, they were very keen to have the flexibility to do what they want because they do like uh, creating little bits of habitat where they can. Um, so the grant fitted in well to that uh, system. Okay, uh, Chris, unmute yourself and you're next. Unmute and then ask your question. That's it. Right. Um, in, the, in the last three photographs you showed us, um, you mentioned um, Valentine's Day. Um, is that because the turtle dove is associated with, with uh, love and romance? Yes, I mean, I think just the general dove uh, symbol of love, uh, oh. not specifically turtle doves. Or, so turtle doves uh, are represented in many, many um, literature novels in the past, you know, hundreds of years. But yeah, the, the connection uh, is just literally through through doves uh, being the symbol of love. Well, actually, um, Shakespeare, I, I'm not sure about today, but Shakespeare does use the turtle dove specifically. Yeah. And not just dove, but the turtle dove. Yeah. Um, as as a, a sort of symbol mm. of love. Is there anything in the bird's behaviour that would give ground for this? Yeah, well, I th it's all based on uh, good science because it, it's based on the fact that they're monogamous, um, and and you know they tend to return to the same site, try to try to return to the same site, and, and find the same same bird that they bred with the previous year. So that's where it comes from. Yeah, um, I know. In in um, the Winter's Tale, he actually um, refers to them as a turtle, not just turtle dove. And yeah. people just imagine, you know, it's a, it's quite a different sort of creature. Yes, that's right. I've heard that same story that it, that it was originally thought of as a turtle. Yeah. But there's one character that calls herself an old turtle, and she means an old turtle dove, but she's <laughs> faithful to her husband's memory. <laughs> and and yeah. apart from that, can I just comment that there's nothing behind this remark. Um, I did notice that the very few women seem to be interested or, in this, this project of yours. And why is that? Uh, I think it's quite the opposite. I maybe should have small slides with women on, Chris. Um, we, I think I am right in saying at least a half of our um, survey volunteers are women. So we uh, I, I was, I mean, occasionally I'm sort of worried about uh, asking people whether it doesn't necessarily mean um, they have to be women, but necessarily asking people to go out into the forest on their own. We do offer chaperones for people who are a bit nervous, but because I think it's so early in the morning, people feel more confident, more excited and more confident. But no, there are a lot of uh, women involved in the project, Chris. In fact, there's more women working in nature conservation now than ever before. 
And in the office that I worked for uh, the National Park in the last uh, three or four years, um, something like 75% of the staff were women. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing the difference in my working lifetime since the 1980s to now is quite incredible uh, within the career anywhere of nature conservation. Right, Pauline, you have to unmute yourself now. You're the next. That's it. Okay. Yes, yeah. I've got two questions really. One is to do with where the farmers sow the seed. And um, you mentioned that they're pioneer species really. So what happens to maintain that ground for the future generations of the birds? That's one question. And my other question is echoing the lady who said, well, what are you doing about the birds being shot en route? And that's, I was just wondering whether the fact that this year, because all through France, a lot of people will be staying at home, will they be shooting more birds or will they maybe be not shooting so many birds? So those are my yeah. two questions. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Pauline. Great, great questions. Uh, the answer to the first one is, uh, this is one of the reasons why we have to pay the farmers to, 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 to work on these plots is they quite they need a lot of work. Having sown the plot, there is a very defined, very um, strict schedule of cutting regime. So every year the plot uh, or every second year the plot is cut in strips to maintain the open and bare ground. So without cutting the plot and and taking off the, the vegetation would lose that bare ground. It would become rank. And every second year, the plot is re-sown. So there's a combination of cutting and re-sowing. And without that, you would it would decline in quality because to maintain that short sward and those pioneer plants, it needs constant uh, work on it. So it is quite an intensive thing to do. But the good thing is we're providing uh, natural seed and that's the important thing we're trying to bring the turtle doves away from people's gardens away from farmyards because that's where uh, the, the the dangers lie there's more dangers for turtle doves and less rich food and the answer to the second question about uh, this summer um, we're hopeful that there'll be less turtle doves shot this summer partly because of lockdown possibly, although I'm not so sure about the effect that would have. But I'm a bit more optimistic in the fact that within the last two years, the European uh, Union has uh, fined two member states, France and Spain, uh, for not uh, installing new hunting uh, quarters for turtle doves. So there's massive pressure now because there's a species action plan for the first time ever in Europe on turtle doves. And every member state has to legally uh, apply hunting uh, moratoriums and quarters, uh, whatever they've agreed with the European Union. So from the point of view of opportunities, in theory, if that species action plan works, the European Union uh, has uh, fines available and member states take notice in theory in the next five years the hunting should have less impact there should be less hunting um, the bird life international representatives and rspb uh, told us at a meeting last year that we've got five years basically to create in as much habitat as possible because we've got an opportunity which is very rare an opportunity which is quite unusual that uh, the hunting organizations have actually come together now um, because one of the hunting organizations had a study done themselves and paid for a study to find out themselves whether their hunting was sustainable not surprisingly this study came back saying no it's not sustainable <clears throat> so uh, a lot of organizations now seem to be waking up to that that problem so i think i'm more optimistic from that point of view which will hopefully be more sustainable than just this this summer's 
uh, lockdown following. I hope that's answered the questions. Mm, very good answer. Thank you, yeah. Right, well, I'm going to ask Prue to give a vote of thanks for, I think, something that we've all really enjoyed. Yes, well, I echo, echo that. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, huge thank you, both pers personally for myself and on behalf of the society. Um, I feel I've learned a huge amount tonight. I didn't really, thinking about it, know much about turtle doves at all. Uh, and probably most I'd heard about them was in various bits of literature and uh, that sort of thing. So absolutely fantastic. But to me, as well as the wealth of information and realization that I could come and see these wonderful birds quite close to home. Um, what came through to me, Richard, was your um, sheer enthusiasm and drive and energy. Um, and you say how wonderful it is to have all these volunteers. But I think the fact is that they go from your example and they are enthused by you. And you seem to manage to move mountains, literally, to get things done and take people along with you. And that's bodes so well for everything. So, um, you know, it's really sort of uplifting to, you know, find out about this sort of work and uh, that so many people are being able to come, come on board. And so thank you very, very much indeed. It's been a fantastic evening. Thank you very much. <clears throat>